Hello guys and welcome to Brockhart Security, where I teach people about cybersecurity awareness, and in this case, how to be a pen tester. It doesn't matter if you're a seasoned veteran, or maybe you're just getting your foot in cybersecurity. Today we're going to be looking at TriHackMe's free junior pen testing learning path, and how you can be a pen testing professional. Let's do this! So once you've logged in and you've set up your profile, let's go check out the course. So as you can see, Try Hack Me has a variety of courses available to us. We have pre-security, cyber defense, junior penetration tester, offensive pen testing. We're gonna go ahead and do the junior penetration tester. This learning path covers the core technical skills that will allow you to succeed as a junior penetration tester. Upon completing this path, you will have the practical skills necessary to perform security assessments against web applications and enterprise infrastructure. Let's go ahead and get started. Our first lesson, pen testing fundamentals. All right, guys, we're at the beginning of our junior pen testing adventure. In the first lesson, we're gonna be learning about pen testing fundamentals. Before teaching you the technical hands-on aspects of ethical hacking, you'll need to understand more about what a penetration tester's job responsibilities are and what processes are followed in performing pen tests. The importance and relevancy of cybersecurity are ever increasing and can be in every walk of life. News headlines fill our screens reporting yet another hack or data leak. Cybersecurity is relevant to all people in the modern world, including a strong password policy to protect your emails or to businesses and other organizations needing to protect both devices and data from damages. A penetration test or pen test is an ethically driven attempt to test and analyze the security defenses to protect these assets and pieces of information. A penetration test involves using the same tools, techniques, and methodologies that someone with malicious intent would use and is similar to an audit. All right. We can mark that complete and go ahead and enter task two, penetration testing ethics. The battle of legality and ethics in cybersecurity, let alone penetration testing, is always controversial. Labels like hacking and hacker often hold negative connotations, especially in pop culture, thanks to a few bad apples. The idea of legally gaining access to a computer system is a challenging concept to grasp. After all, what makes it legal exactly? Hmm, good question. Recall that a penetration test is an authorized audit of a computer system security and defenses as agreed by the owners of the systems. The legality of penetration is pretty clear cut in this sense. Anything that falls outside of this agreement is deemed unauthorized. Before a penetration test starts, a formal discussion occurs between the penetration tester and the system owner. Various tools, techniques, and systems to be tested are agreed on. This discussion forms the scope of the penetration testing agreement and will determine the course the penetration test takes. Companies that provide penetration testing services are held against legal frameworks and industry accreditation. For example, the National Cyber Security Center, NCSC, has the CHECK accreditation scheme in the UK. This CHECK means that only check approved companies can conduct authorized penetration tests of public sector and CNI systems and networks, NCSC. Ethics is the moral debate between right and wrong. Where an action may be legal, it may go against an individual's belief system of right and wrong. So that's also important to include in the scope before we start our penetration test. Penetration testers will often be faced with potentially morally questionable decisions during a penetration test. For example, they're gaining access to a database and being presented with potentially sensitive data. Or they are perhaps performing a phishing attack on an employee to test an organization's human security. If that action has been agreed upon during the initial stages, it is legal, however ethically questionable. For example, a lot of times in a penetration test, you might have to lie to someone to try and get inside their business or security infrastructure. 
hackers are sorted into three hats where there are ethics and motivations behind their different actions. As we can see here in the table, we have the white hat, gray hat, and black hat. White hat hackers are considered the good people. They remain within the law and use their skills to benefit others. For example, a penetration tester performing an authorized engagement on a company. A gray hat are people that use their skills to benefit others often. However, they do not respect or follow the law of ethical standards at all times. For example, someone taking down a scamming site, black hat hackers are criminals and often seek to damage organizations or gain some form of financial benefit at the cost of others. For example, ransomware authors infect devices with malicious code and hold data for ransom. You've probably seen that on the news lately. Rules of Engagement, ROE. The ROE is a document that is created at the initial stages of a penetration testing engagement. This document consists of three main sections explained in the table below, which are ultimately responsible for deciding how the engagement is carried out. The SANS Institute has a great example of this document, which you can view online here. The permission section gives explicit permission for the engagement to be carried out. This permission is essential to legally protect individuals and organizations for the activities they carry out. The test scope section. This section of the document will annotate specific targets to which the engagement should apply. For example, the penetration test may only apply to certain servers or applications, but not the entire network. Rules. The rules section will define exactly the techniques that are permitted during the engagement. For example, the rules may specifically state that techniques such as phishing attacks are prohibited, but man-in-the-middle attacks are okay. And we can go ahead and answer the questions below. You are given permission to perform a security audit on an organization. What type of hacker would you be? Well, we'd be a white hat. You attack an organization and steal their data. What type of hacker would you be? Well, in this context, probably a black hat. What document defines how a penetration test engagement should be carried out? Well, these would be the rules of engagement. Now that we've completed that task, we can go ahead and go to task three, penetration testing methodologies. Penetration tests can have a wide variety of objectives and targets within scope. Because of this, no penetration test is the same, and there are no one case fits all as to how a penetration tester should approach it. That's an important one. The steps a penetration tester takes during an engagement is known as the methodology. A practical methodology is a smart one, where the steps taken are relevant to the situation at hand. For example, having a methodology that you would use to test the security of a web application is not practical when you have to test the security of a network. Before discussing some different industry standard methodologies, we should note that all of them have a general theme of the following stages. Stage one, information gathering. This stage involves collecting as much publicly accessible information about a target or organization as possible. For example, open source intelligence and research. Stage two, enumeration scanning. This stage involves discovering applications and services running on the systems. For example, finding a web server that may be potentially vulnerable. Number three, exploitation. This stage involves leveraging vulnerabilities discovered on a system or application. This stage can involve the use of public exploits or exploiting application logic. You can see as we move further and further throughout the stages, we're getting more and more intimate onto their systems. Privilege escalation. Once you have successfully exploited a system or application known as a foothold, this stage is the attempt to expand your access to a system. You can escalate horizontally and vertically, where horizontally is accessing another account of the same permission group, i.e. another user whereas vertically is that of another permission group, i.e. an administrator. Post-exploitation is the final stage. 
This stage involves a few sub-stages. What other hosts can be targeted? What additional information can we gather from the host that we are a privileged user? Covering your tracks and reporting. The Open Source Security Testing Methodology Manual, it's a mouthful, otherwise called OSSTMM, provides a detailed framework of testing meth strategies for system software applications, communications, and the human aspect of cybersecurity. This methodology focuses primarily on how these systems applications communicate, so it includes a methodology for telecommunications, wired networks, wireless communications. Looks like there are some intentionally left blank disadvantage, disadvantages for the OSS TMM framework, and that's simply because this framework is difficult to understand, very detailed, and tends to use unique definitions. The advantages of OSS TMM include covering various testing strategies, testing strategies for specific targets, framework for flexible depending upon the organization's needs. Meant to set a standard for systems and applications, meaning that a universal methodology can be used in a penetration testing scenario. And the reason why it's so complicated and hard to understand is because it tries to encompass this standard for all systems and applications as a universal methodology. The OWASP, or Open Web Application Security Project, is a community-driven and frequently updated framework used solely to test the security of web applications and services. The foundation regularly writes reports stating the top 10 security vulnerabilities a web application may have, the testing approach, and remediation. Advantages of OWASP include easy to pick up and understand, actively maintained, and is frequently updated, it covers all stages of an engagement from testing to reporting and remediation. Specializes in web applications and services. Some of the disadvantages of OWASP include it may not be clear what type of vulnerability a web application has. They can often overlap. OWASP does not make suggestions to any specific software development life cycles. Also, the framework doesn't hold any accreditation such as check. OWASP is a really good framework to learn because not only do they include an OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities, but in cybersecurity and as a penetration tester, you're going to be dealing with web applications a lot. The NIST Cybersecurity Framework 1.1. The NIST Cybersecurity Framework is a popular framework used to improve an organization's cybersecurity standards and manage the risk of cyber threats. This framework is a bit of an honorable mention because of its popularity and detail. The framework provides guidelines on security controls and benchmarks for success for organizations from critical infrastructure, power plants, etc., all through to commercial. There is a limited section on standard guideline for the methodology a penetration tester should take. The advantages of NIST include being estimated to be used by half of American organizations by 2020. The framework is extremely detailed in setting standards to help organizations mitigate the threat posed by cyber threats, frequently updated, and NIST provides accreditation for organizations that use this framework. NIST also is designed to implement alongside other frameworks. Now that's a plus. Some of the disadvantages of NIST include it has many iterations of frameworks, so it may be difficult to decide which one applies to your organization. It has weak auditing policies, making it difficult to determine how a breach occurred. And the framework does not consider cloud computing, which is quickly becoming increasingly popular for organizations. And I can attest to that one. Cloud computing is becoming very popular. NCSC CAF, the Cyber Assessment Framework, or simply CAF, is an extensive framework for 14 principles used to assess the risk of various cyber threats and an organization's defenses against these. We can see the UK logo there with the unicorn in the line. The framework applies to organizations considered to perform vitally important services and activities. 
such as critical infrastructure, banking, and the likes. The framework mainly focuses on and assesses the following topics. Data security, system security, identity and access control, resiliency, monitoring, response, and recovery planning. Some of the advantages of NCSC CAF or CAF include being backed by a government cybersecurity agency. It also provides accreditation and it covers 14 principles which range from security to response. CAF is still new in the industry, meaning that organizations haven't had much time to make the necessary changes to be suitable for it. The framework is based on principles and ideas and isn't as direct as having rules like some of the other frameworks. All right, once you've read through that, now we can go ahead and answer some of these questions. What stage of penetration testing involves using publicly available information? If we look up at the top, the first stage of a penetration test would be information gathering. Got that correct? If you wanted to use a framework for pen testing telecommunications, what framework would you use? Note, we're looking for the acronym here and not the full name. Well, if you scroll back up, you'll remember that OSSTMM covers telecommunication, which includes phones and voice over internet protocol. Put that in here. What framework focuses on the testing of web applications? Well, if you'll remember, this was OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project. After that, we can go ahead and go to task four. Oh, we have the three types of hackers. There are three primary scopes when testing an application or service. Your understanding of your target will determine the level of testing that you perform in your penetration testing engagement. In this task, we'll cover these three different scopes of testing. Black box testing. This testing process is a high level process where the tester is not given any information about the inner workings of the application or service. The tester acts as a regular user testing the functionality and interaction of the application or piece of software. This testing can involve interacting with the interface, i.e. buttons, and testing to see whether the intended result is returned. Hmm. No knowledge of programming or understanding of the program is necessary for this type of testing, i.e. script kiddies. Black box testing significantly increases the amount of time spent during the information gathering and enumeration phase to understand the attack surface of the target. Gray box. This testing process is the most popular for things such as penetration testing. It is a combination of both black and white box testing processes. The tester will have some limited knowledge of the internal components of the application or piece of software. Still, it will be interacting with the application as if it were a black box scenario, and then using their knowledge of the application to try and resolve issues as they find them. With gray box testing, the limited knowledge given saves time and is often chosen for extremely well-hardened attack surfaces. Partial knowledge here. Full knowledge is white box. This testing process is a low-level process usually done by a software developer who knows programming and application logic. The tester will be testing the internal components of the application or piece of software, and for example, ensuring that specific functions work correctly and within a reasonable amount of time. The tester will have a full knowledge of the application and its expected behavior is much more time consuming than black box testing. The full knowledge in a white box testing scenario provides a testing approach that guarantees the entire attack surface can be validated. And if we look back over these one more time, you'll recognize that the black box testing is really done when you want a really real world scenario. This is the hacker not having any knowledge at all and trying to break in from the outside. Gray box happens when an employer wants to see some information given, such as maybe IP addresses or a specific infrastructure piece, but everything else may be given no knowledge. White box testing is given full knowledge, and because so much knowledge is given, 
it often takes the most time to carry out the penetration test. All right, we're ready for the questions here. You were asked to test an application but are not given access to its source code. What testing process is this? Well, in this case, it'd be a black box. You were asked to test a website and you were given an access to the source code. What testing process is this? Well, in this case, it's gonna be a white box. Okay, let's move on to the final task, task five, practical ACME penetration test. ACME has approached you for an assignment. They want you to carry out the stages of a penetration test on their infrastructure. View the site by clicking the green button on this task and follow the guided instructions to complete this exercise. Okay, let's go ahead and spin up the site. Okay, our first penetration test. Our rules of engagement. Remember, this is the first part of a penetration test. We gotta get that certification that we can actually perform a penetration test. Let's go through the stages of a penetration test for the Acme company. This stage of the penetration test is where you define three primary objectives. Cycle through the tab below to explore these. Okay. For a penetration test to be ethical and legal, both parties, the company wanting to do their testing for their application vulnerabilities and the company conducting the pen test, will sign a document giving clear permission for the intended actions. As you can see here, they have their Acme email server up, their inbox. We have permission to perform the penetration test and we put you on this one. The client has sent an attachment a statement of work and scoping document which is attached to this email. Please use this to begin the engagement. Thanks, Ben. Okay, our testing scope. The test scope will define what targets or environments are being tested against. For example, the client may only want you to test part of their application and not their entire network. Remember this because when you're doing a penetration test, sometimes the business is gonna have to keep working. They can't just completely halt everything. So by you going in there and unplugging a bunch of metaphorical wires, well, it could stop and disrupt business and do more harm than good. Okay, if we head to the rules, the rules define the type of behavior a penetration tester will employ. For example, you may only have access to part of the application and not the entire server that hosts it. Abby Feltwood, HR administrator at the Acme company. We can see she lists her email right there. The information gathering stage of engagement is often undervalued. This stage involves using publicly accessible channels to collect intel on your target. Abby, who has a public profile on LinkedIn, advertises that she works for Acme and even includes her email in her bio, which is a possible way we can target her work laptop and thus the company. Enumeration and scanning is the third stage. The goal of this stage is to get a complete picture of your target. A penetration tester will try to identify user accounts, machines on their network, network shares, applications, etc. Information gathered from stage two and the engagement scope document will help in enumerating your target. The enumeration phase is very important as your findings are used to exploit your target systems. Stage four. Let's pretend Abby from stage two made a post on LinkedIn, sharing a blog post she wrote about Acme. From this post, you find Acme's web server's IP, 96.37.50.151. Go ahead, try scanning it. So we're gonna go ahead and enter the IP address. You can see our little terminal down here using some kind of scan. Okay, we've started the scan. Okay, so we have gotten some information back from our enumeration and scanning phase. It looks like there is a service that's vulnerable. It's on the web and it's not a login. Let's go ahead and go to the fourth stage, exploitation. The exploitation stage involves the knowledge from your enumeration to now identify and exploit vulnerabilities in any of their applications. For example, we enumerated Acme's website in stage three and found that it was vulnerable. We would now exploit this vulnerability, thus ethically hacking Acme's website. 
Exploitation is the use of a vulnerability discovered to gain unauthorized access to an information security system or data. And you can see our uh, target is being uh, exploited by a, looks like a Metasploit framework right now uh, using KZ. So this is something we'll learn about later. Uh, right now, you can just know that Metasploit, we are using the exploitation that we found through the previous stages. Post-exploitation. The post-exploitation stage starts when you've gained unauthorized access to a system. At this stage of the engagement, your main goals will be to maintain access to the system and escalate your privileges within the system so, to a super user or administrator user. Systems are usually set up with normal users that don't have access to various sensitive files and functions. Gaining access to higher privileges users such as administrators will allow you to perform actions that you wouldn't be able to as a normal user, such as reading sensitive files and gaining access to all programs within the system. After doing this, you'll be extracting sensitive information from the system and attacking other components in the environment. We can see we have our low privileged user and we're gonna go ahead and climb up to maybe be an administrator. The last phase of penetration test is pen test report and clearing up. This stage usually occurs at the end of a penetration test. As a penetration tester, you will have to explain the results of your engagement to the client. This is usually done in the form of a report that contains details regarding any security issues you've found and how to mitigate them. The client will use this report to understand the security issues and fix the flaws in the technology stack that was tested. It's also best practice to clean up the environment you've been testing where possible. For example, if you were provided access to machines or tooling by the client, you need to delete any artifacts out of it created as a result of testing. Clean up, clean up, clean up, guys. That's very important. You don't just do the test and walk away and say, good luck. No, it's always best etiquette. Go ahead and clean up after yourself. And we can see that we found the flag Try Hack Me, pen test complete. So we're gonna go ahead and copy that. Submit it as our answer. All right, guys, you're done.